This is the Cambridge English Proficiency Test 1. I am going to give you the instructions for this test. I shall introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you will hear this sound. You will hear each piece twice. Remember, while you are listening, write your answers on the question paper. You will have five minutes at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. There will now be a pause. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1 So, James, what's happening with the cracks in the ceiling of the Blue Salon? Well, the last restoration of this ceiling took place 65 years ago and the team are having a hard time removing that paint job. People didn't seem to understand at the time that reversibility is a core principle of restoration work. Right. Nothing that's done should be too permanent. Yeah, in case a better method for restoration comes along. But they're getting there. Anyway... That's great news that you were able to buy back the original dining table, Emily. Yeah, thanks. Do you know it was one of the first pieces to be sold on after the palace was looted during the English Civil War? The detective work involved in tracking all the documentation was a pain. It took months, but it paid off in the end. The table was finally discovered in a private house in Australia, and luckily, two donors came forward with the money, or it would have blown our entire budget. So, James, what's happening with the cracks in the ceiling of the Blue Salon? Well, the last restoration of this ceiling took place 65 years ago and the team are having a hard time removing that paint job. People didn't seem to understand at the time that reversibility is a core principle of restoration work. Right. Nothing that's done should be too permanent. Yeah, in case a better method for restoration comes along. But they're getting there. Anyway... That's great news that you were able to buy back the original dining table, Emily. Yeah, thanks. Do you know it was one of the first pieces to be sold on after the palace was looted during the English Civil War? The detective work involved in tracking all the documentation was a pain. It took months, but it paid off in the end. The table was finally discovered in a private house in Australia, and luckily, two donors came forward with the money, or it would have blown our entire budget. Extract 2 What are the gelata monkeys doing that other primates don't? Because I thought they all communicate vocally in some way. They definitely do. But the issue for scientists has been, if you're thinking about where language came from, that most primate vocalizations are quite simple and flat, sort of monosyllabic grunts. And if you look at what humans do when we communicate, it's nothing like that. So we make these long strings of really complicated sounds with ups and downs, and loud parts and high parts. So scientists started to actually look elsewhere for possible precursors to human speech. And one thing they've been looking at is this facial movement that most primates do, including gelatas, called lip smacking. So this is a gesture that they perform in kind of friendly interactions between individuals. They're moving their mouth very quickly, sort of rapidly opening and closing their mouth. But in the case of these particular monkeys, they actually vocalize while lip-smacking. And this produces a kind of undulation in the sound, which we call a wobble. 
and it's the pattern of intervals between the wobbles that reflects our own speech. What are the gelata monkeys doing that other primates don't? Because I thought they all communicate vocally in some way. They definitely do. But the issue for scientists has been, if you're thinking about where language came from, that most primate vocalizations are quite simple and flat, sort of monosyllabic grunts. And if you look at what humans do when we communicate, it's nothing like that. So we make these long strings of really complicated sounds with ups and downs, and loud parts and high parts. So scientists started to actually look elsewhere for possible precursors to human speech. And one thing they've been looking at is this facial movement that most primates do, including gelatas, called lip smacking. So this is a gesture that they perform in kind of friendly interactions between individuals. They're moving their mouth very quickly, sort of rapidly opening and closing their mouth. But in the case of these particular monkeys, they actually vocalize while lip-smacking. And this produces a kind of undulation in the sound, which we call a wobble. And it's the pattern of intervals between the wobbles that reflects our own speech. Extract 3 How do you think journalism has changed over the years? Technology changes things. It shouldn't affect the content, but it does eventually. So, for example, the first impressions of anything, shocking, surprising, enlightening, are often inaccurate. But when stuff's going out live, both sound and pictures, which is increasingly what's expected, you don't have time to judge, ask why, know if something's staged or false, or it's misleading and insignificant. So there's more shaky information around now. Then there's the internet. The bulk hits on news sites are people reading five headlines. It takes them 15 seconds. They don't read further unless it's something that pulls them in, whereas with a newspaper you sit through it, whether you're really interested or not. News used to be like a plate full of food and you had to plough your way through everything you were given. Nowadays, it's self-service on the internet. You've got a buffet of information and most people just eat the chips and pudding, and those are sport and celebs. The rest of it, unrest in a foreign country, social complexities at home, are the bits which aren't actually very palatable. How do you think journalism has changed over the years? Technology changes things. It shouldn't affect the content, but it does eventually. So, for example, the first impressions of anything, shocking, surprising, enlightening, are often inaccurate. But when stuff's going out live, both sound and pictures, which is increasingly what's expected, you don't have time to judge, ask why, know if something's staged or false, or it's misleading and insignificant. So there's more shaky information around now. Then there's the internet. The bulk hits on news sites are people reading five headlines. It takes them 15 seconds. They don't read further unless it's something that pulls them in, whereas with a newspaper you sit through it, whether you're really interested or not. News used to be like a plate full of food and you had to plough your way through everything you were given. Nowadays, it's self-service on the internet. You've got a buffet of information and most people just eat the chips and pudding, and those are sport and celebs. The rest of it, unrest in a foreign country, social complexities at home, are the bits which aren't actually very palatable. That is the end of part one.